Good evening. On behalf of Fauquier County Public Schools, Head Start, and St. James Episcopal Church and School, I'd like to welcome you to our first of three <coughs> preschool parent workshops. A special thank you to the PATH Foundation, formerly known as the Fauquier Health Foundation, for funding tonight's workshop. I'd also like to thank Manhattan Pizza for their donation. Just a reminder that we might be having some photos taken tonight. You may have seen our signs throughout. If you would not like to be photographed, we have a section in the back that's taped off. Please go there now. If you have any children that you would do not want to have photographed, I'm going to stand here for a minute before I go down to the other location. Come and see me, and we will make sure that the photographer does not go into the room where your children are. There will be no identifying information shared on anybody that's here. Um, let's see. On your, sh on your seats, we have some cards for you to give feedback for us on tonight's performance. Please share with us any suggestions you have for future workshops or any feedback you have for us in general. I hope you'll come back and join us again next month when the presentation will focus on early literacy and speech and language, and again in April when we focus on gross motor activities. I'm pleased to introduce our presenter for tonight. This is Mrs. Lisa Arto. She's an occupational therapist with Fauquier County Public Schools and has been with us for over 30 years, or has been an occupational therapist for over 30 years. Um, she asked me not to share how many more than that. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, I welcome Lisa. Aww. Thank you so much. <laughs> so I talked with my hands, so I'm going to try to lock it in place and we'll see how this rolls. All right, and please feel free to, to go like this if you can't hear me, or you can go like this if it's a little too loud, but none of this, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep talking. All right, um, welcome. We are so glad you are here. This is a cold night, and we have a great turnout, and I'm thrilled that you're part of this. This is an evening. This is an opportunity to celebrate your children, to have a, a few more skills that you know how to use at home to help your children learn how to use their hands in order to prepare for kindergarten. It's a very exciting journey. And this is just a simple analogy. Just as runners need to prepare their bodies for a race, children will need to prepare their hands for kindergarten. And when you think about that, if you're going to sign up for a race, you're going to learn how to stretch, you're going to learn how to do warm-ups, you're going to look at what kind of equipment you have, like do you have the right running shoes? You're going to prepare for this race. As children are preparing for kindergarten, they need to prepare their hands. And years ago we didn't think about this so much because years ago our kids used to play with hands more. It's different nowadays. So if they're coming to school, which we're seeing with a little bit of undeveloped hands, they're still participating in the race, but it's not as easy for them a little bit slower, it's a little bit tougher, and we're here today to talk about things that you can do with your children to make it more successful for them. Now when I talk to kindergarten teachers and say, what are the, the main domains that your children are struggling with? How can we help you through this program help the children prepare? And the three things that kept coming back are coloring, Rewriting and cutting. What we love to see in preschool is lots of opportunity for play, for strengthening, for coordination, social interaction, <coughs> lots of sensory input. That's what preschool is about. And you can learn some pre writing strokes. We're not saying no, no, no. But we are saying let's give those hands a chance to develop before we bump into that kindergarten program. Before um, we move forward with how we're going to do all this wonderful magic, we're going to actually go back a little bit. So we're going to go back in the sense of going back in time. We're going to talk a little bit about how important it is for infants, for toddlers, for preschools to prepare. And we're also going to go back in time in the sense of how is it different nowadays than it was when we were growing up? What are the problems and what are the solutions? And our, our primary problem that we keep coming back to, what is so different, 
is babies need tummy time. Now, I imagine most of you are familiar with that. It, it was coined in, in the early 1990s, and that's when doctors were saying, boy, we got to keep these babies on their back when they're sleep, sleeping to, to prevent SIDS, to decrease risks. And what was happening is our children weren't developing from their trunk proximal on out distally because they weren't on their tummies anymore. So tummy time, right now, the American Pediatric Association is saying, like three months old, they should be getting 90 minutes of tummy time a day. Not all at once, that would drive us all crazy. We'd have a lot of crying babies. But to do little bits all the time, whether it's having a child lying on your chest, or over a ball for therapy, or maybe even on the floor playing with toys just set in front of them, that's the kind of tummy time we're looking for. And what does that do? Well, that gives us that trunk support that we need, and it's called proximal. That means close to your trunk. So we're looking at shoulder stability. In the back, your scapula, your shoulder blades, we're looking for those to come back and be strong. That's, that's tummy time. That is pure magic. There's only one thing, I think, that is even better than tummy time. Babies need to crawl. Now, you know how often we say, my child walked at eight months or nine months. Yay! A therapist, you'll hear them all go, oh, no, I'm so sorry. Just crawling is key. It is key for so many things. One of the things, going right back to tummy time, it's about your trunk. It's about core. It's about stability. It's about your shoulders. And bringing that all up. But you know what else? It's about your head and your neck. When you're crawling and you're getting your head up because you want to go over there, you're getting some magical input in the back of your brain that helps you organize all your experiences in your environment up here that help you engage with your world. There's a, the, a key word is vestibular, but what you really need to know is when your head changes in space, that's a good thing. We love that when kids crawl. So they're getting that trunk, they're getting that shoulder, and now they're, they're getting that information in their head. And when they start crawling, and you see this right, left, right, left, and then it's going in an asymmetrical pattern with their legs, there is something going on up here. You have a half of your brain that's your right, a half that's your left, and in between, we have this bridge, we call it, the bridge of information, and it flows back and forth. And when you crawl, believe it or not, that is going to help you with things like crossing midline. And what that means is the center line down your body, and if you cross over, that's how you read. That's how you write. That's how you're using your two hands together for activities, and for us, for kindergarten, coloring and cutting and writing. So going all the way back to that, that stage, that 8 to 11 month successful crawling, that's going to help your kid in kindergarten. There's a couple other things that happen with that. There's certainly sensory experience. Are you crawling on carpeting? Are you crawling on linoleum? Sensory in the sense of sometimes kids will put a little toy into their hand and they'll keep crawling that sensory input. We also have, when kids are crawling and they're here, that they decide, I want to crawl over there. There's an empty uh, box of Cheerios that just spilt over. That's my next mission. Well, they're starting here, the starting point, and then with that head coming up, they're looking over there. That's far vision. So we have near vision and we have far vision. And that child is going to crawl, 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 crawl. And how does that help in school? Well, nowadays we don't use chalkboards as much, but we use smart boards, and they will copy something from out there. They'll be engaged with something that's going on up on the stage, and then they'll come back down, and they'll be doing some writing, or they'll be discussing it with their peers, but they have to see far, and then they relate it to whatever they're working on close. And that has to do with crawling, so it's a very good thing. Oh. As an OT, I almost forgot the main thing that I get so excited about with crawling that people don't think about. Your hands. We talk about hands. Crawling, when you think about it, 
and you're putting all that weight through your shoulders, through your elbows, through your wrists, into your palms, your hands, strengthen your hands. All right, opportunity, audience participation. Come to Las Vegas. So you're going to cup your hand in front of you like this. Pretend you have a couple dice in it, and you're going to give it a shake, 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 freeze. And now if you look at your hand, hopefully you are looking at some arching in your hand. Those arches help build up those side muscles. Do you see those thicker muscles on the side? That's what we want for strengthening for your children. Now if you give it a little bit of a twist, you're going to turn it to the side. And as OTs, occupational therapists, what we love to see is this nice, wide, swooping web space as your thumb rotates. That is key for school development. That is key for function, especially in the school environment. So all around, can't go wrong with crawling. All right, our next slide. Some of the problems that we're seeing is also that toddlers need to spend less time in our confined seating. Car seats, strollers, high chairs. I think we kind of sort of all know that. And, and I'm a mother of multiple children. And yes, that third one was in her bucket a lot when I went to swimming lessons with the other two. Or if I had to, to go out to birthday parties in the bucket, in the bucket. And, and, and you do what you have to do. But try not to keep them in there. Now you see the, the, the first baby in the, in the car seat. And car seats are good. We're good. She's strapped in. But when you think about it, with those shields, that padding up on the side, how much visual input do you think she's having? I'm, I'm going to guess around 40 degrees on the sides. How much can she see? There's limited interaction. How much input is there coming to the body? Nothing. She's going to strap right in there. So she's missing out on all those kind of crawling things that we talked about for engaging in your environment. Now baby B on the side, when you do pop them out of that carrier and you put them on your hip, look at all that cool stuff that's going on. So if you can see over here on the hip, we have, let's start again what we are talking about. We have that core, that trunk. That trunk is not slouched back into a confined seating. That core is coming up and wow, we've got some torso rotation there. That's another very good thing. And you see that engagement and balance and my head in space and reaching engagement? This is a good thing. How much visual input do you think this kid has? We're not limited to the side like this anymore. Wow, when you throw in that trunk and neck rotation, we've got a lot going on. And the kid on the hip is going to engage in their environment. If somebody comes by, oh, you're so cute. You don't get that as much if they're buckled in and, and, and kind of tucked in a bucket. So that's kind of also an extra little perk with that. Uh-huh. Anybody see this? The older kids at home? Yeah, yeah. We're all, this part, technology is a wonderful thing in our world. But us, we have to look at this as parents. This is our job. We need to look at having some limitations with our time with technology. One of the sites I was, I was looking at was saying young people spend at least seven hours a day with input, technology input. Hello, that's just called school. There's those cell phones. There's the video games. There's the media. I bet it's way, way more than seven. That seems so conservative to me. But what they are recommending is one to two hours max of the media, of the enterta entertainment time. And for ages two and under, not even the minimal, minimal. That's not what it's about. It's about social time. It's not about screen time. It's about having your kids engage in their world and use their hands. Let's look at that first fellow. OK, social engagement. We got that totally tuned out. Um, when, when we talk about using your hands, they're both static. They're not, not moving a whole bunch. Little tapping with his thumb. But he, he's, he's kind of in his little own world there. And our, our, our gal, a number two, she's engaged too. She's not getting a whole lot of that core support. She's not getting her shoulder. She's not working those hand muscles. This is what's different nowadays. 
when the, when our generations or before us were were involved with activities, they were activities that really worked our muscles and we used our hands and we, we played with toys that our kids don't play with as much anymore. So this is something that we just have to look at as a natural consequence and this is something we need to look at what can we do differently. So this is just giving you some, some background of why we are dealing with things the way we are dealing with things nowadays in kindergarten. Alright, in a half hour's time the most important hand skill that I would like you to take away with you, your take-home take point, is learn to separate the sides of your hand. And what that means is if you hold your hand up and, and you draw a line between your ring finger and, and tall man all the way down, these two are called stability. stability. And this is called mobility. And it's the same with the trunk. If you don't have it going on here for stability, you can't write. If you are a noodle through the letter C, you just can't hold yourself straight. If you don't have proximal, you don't have distal. So if we break that down into just our hand, if you don't have stability here, it's really hard to have mobility here. I guess this would be a good homework assignment at this time is when you go home look at your kids hands and see how much arching is there how, how much did your muscles build up there what and we'll talk about solutions and what to do with that but it's kind of nice to know where you started I want with that in mind I want to mention that Different people have different tone, and as occupational therapists, physical therapists, we use the word tone maybe a little bit different than you might hear it at the gym. Tone is not so much strength, it's really what are your muscles like at rest? So high tone would be like somebody who's in function or extension, high tone at rest. And then there's normal tone that most of us have. That our ability to respond to our environment with ease. And then there's low tone. How many of you have heard of that phrase, low tone, before? Okay, with low tone, um, that means at rest, like your muscles are almost, they feel a little bit softer. They still function in the world just fine. All you have to do is recruit some muscle strength and you've got it. But it's, it's at rest. It's not firing like normal tone. And the second thing that's packaged with that is you usually have a little bit more range of motion with your joints, low tone, loose ligaments. And that's a little bit harder. So when you look at your kid's palm tonight, some kids naturally are going to have a little bit flatter palm. But ask them to shake a pair of dice with you and see if they can build up those arches. Are they there? If they're not, then you're going to really key into some of the activities we have at the end. All right, as far as that stability, mobility, there are some more fun ways to say that to kids. And one of our favorite ways to teach kids stability, mobility, is we call it secret side down. And you, you can give them something tiny, a uh, Cheerio or a plastic bead, perhaps a penny, something at home, easy to find, and they tuck it under their ring and their little finger, and then these three, the thumb and two fingers, are ready to work together. But we're, we know what we're working on, but they think they're working on a game. Oh, what do you have behind Secret Side Down? Do you have the little orange tiger? No. Do you have the marble? No. And you can make it really fun. And this way they are learning how to use their hands. Now, another way that we have fun with this in teaching the kids how to separate the sides of their hands for function is we call it the crab hello. So you, you have a circle of kids at your feet and you say, boys and girls, we are going to learn a new way to say hello. Do you remember Secret Side Down? Do you remember how we, and, the, and, and you know, nowadays everybody's pretty much struggling getting that. They're like, that's right, that's right. That is Secret Side Down. Now, 
Now, I have a friend with me, my little friend, Mr. Crab, and he wants to teach us to say hello. Does he have a thumb and four fingers like we do? No. What does he have? What is that called again? It's called a claw. You're right. Mr. Crab has a claw. He has a special way to say hello, and he's going he's gonna to share that with us today. So what you do, secret side down, you rotate that thumb, and you go tap, 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 like the crab, hello. So you have all these kids that are just tapping and saying hi and trying to pinch their neighbor. And you remind them, Mr. Crab, we're not pinching. We are just saying hello. And then they start competing. Look, Mr. Toe, I, I can do two crab hellos. <laughs> it gets a little crazy, but we're practicing secret side down, and we're practicing the crab hello. And this, this is where some pretty cool stuff comes in for your school. This is also how we're going to hold a pencil. And that is why it's really important that we talk to them about the crab and not the duck. You know how many kids say, look at me. I've got my crab hello. Oh, no, you don't, Jonathan. That is a duck quacking. And we don't want the duck quacking with that flat, flat face. We want k -k -k, like the letter C. We want curled back. And we want tapping like this. And what Jonathan just showed me, I bet he's got flatter arches. I bet he doesn't have that strength yet in his hands because that nice web space that I told you about that we look for, he just collapsed it. When you're doing the duck instead of the crab, you are missing out on all this. The crab balances muscles within your hand that begin and end in your hand as well as the ones that begin way back here at your elbow. But when you go to the just the duck, you're only using muscles that begin and end in your hand, and you're missing out on all this. So if you are practicing that little game with the crab, make sure it's the letter C, and you got that nice rotation and that nice tap. All right, and how does this all lend itself to school? Well, it's helping kids prepare to color. So how many of you have heard of handwriting without tears? It's on the web. There's products out there. It's on the back of you know, if your hand up for a reference. It's just a, a great website for things to help you. They have home programs. There's things we use in schools. It's good to know about. Well, she created a cute little song about how you hold your crayon or how you hold your pencil. It's the same thing. Guess what? It's the crab hello. This is where I get to pull out one of my props. Ta-da! Pencil large enough for you to see. And if we look at the words, I promise I won't say them, look at the words. My thumb is bent. Pointer points to the tip. And tall man uses his side. I tuck my last two fingers in, and I take it for a ride. It's a short little ditty. It's right on their website. It's kind of fun. But that would be a nice one, a nice reference for you to get them used to secret side down. I tuck those fingers in. My thumb is bent. Those are the sorts of things we're looking for, for, for coloring and for writing and pre-writing. Um, at this time is, is a, a good place to start to let you know, you, you know, just when we say, oh, we want your kids to walk, and yet they're just doing tummy time. They're not even crawling yet. Well, we know that's not how it works developmentally. Let's just get up and walk. This is what I want to see. We're going to walk. That doesn't happen. It's all developmental. So all this wonderful stuff I'm telling you what we want to see in kindergarten, I'm just going to show you a couple examples of what younger kids are going to do. So a one and a half year old is not going to bend his thumb and, and have his pointer finger down and tuck in his fingers because one and a half year olds don't know how to do that. Their hands don't work that way yet. So when kids start scribbling when they're young, have you seen this? Okay, that's developmentally correct for that one and a half year old. And it's not exactly per month, it's just kind of developmental, just like some kids crawl later, some crawl earlier, some walk earlier, some walk later. It's developmental. The next thing that you might see <coughs> is where your forearm turns.
say you're two or three years old, and your coloring still a little bit mostly from your wrist and your elbow, but your fingers are down. And when you're two or three old, we say, yay, that is so good. And then when they're three or four, wow, you think you got it going on because it's a thumb and two fingers. And it's like this, and they're writing from your wrist, and you're going, got it, so close. Four, age five, that's when we get my thumb is bent. That's a key word in there. My thumb is bent, pointy points to the tip, okay, and sort of singing a little bit. Tall man uses his side. When we do that, that thumb bent, ta-da, proximal to distal, now doesn't mean trunk anymore to shoulder to hand. And it's not even like your elbow to your wrist, your hand, all of a sudden, stability, mobility, proximal, distal. Now that means, wow, you got it going on at your fingertips. You are coloring, you are writing dynamically with your fingertips. And that is what we ultimately want to see in kindergarten. So be patient with your child as they continue to develop with that strength. It's a good thing. But um, when we see kids like this, no! <laughs> or, or even if they do, they get the tripod going on, and that thumb wraps around, guess what? You're writing from your wrist again. And that, for some kids, that's almost like carpal tunnel. You know, it, it, can, it can get some swelling, their hand can hurt, and they hate writing. We don't want that in kindergarten. So we always tell our kindergartners, what do we say, boys and girls? Say no to the thumb wrap. No thumb wrap. Say no to the thumb wrap. So we get that thumb is bent, pointer points to the tip. And with that, even when they're little itty bitty like kindergarten, we can say, you can just use your thumb and your finger to hold that crayon. You don't even need to have tall man on his side, which is true, just to get that thumb going back and forth. Let's see, okay, I think y'all got secret side down. I must have said that at least 20 times. Make sure they have their wrist on the table. This because we don't want those elbows floating up in the air. One way that we do this, have a little fun with them, is say, okay, boys and girls, and not all of them can do this, put your hand up in the sky like you're carrying a big pizza pie. Now, I want you to take your finger and go over and find this skateboard wheel in your hand. You have a skateboard wheel in your hand. Let's all spin that wheel. Spin, spin, spin. And, then, and when you write, boys and girls, got to keep that skateboard on the table. Let's practice without a crayon. Can you move your hand? Skateboard's down. Let me see you. Skateboard's down. And they're doing it, and they're doing it. And then you make a tricky by like holding the crayon the right way. But you do that. Crab, hello. Stick your side down. My thumb is bent. Skateboard's down. Woo. So what else we have here? Smaller pictures help the finger muscles get stronger. Larger pictures use the whole arm. Doesn't that make sense? Say you had a great big um, house to color in, and you're just going to go at it. All of us would. We would be using our elbow, and maybe you get to the door, the windows. We're using our wrist. It might not be till you find little flowers in front that you'd finally be using that little tiny thumb and fingers. So that's just something good to keep in mind when you have coloring books with your kids. That smaller pictures um, bring out the most dynamic use of your hand. Alright, there's a couple things that we can do for some warm-up. And um, I'll have to talk my way through them because my videos didn't load. Oh darn it. But that's okay. I'm going to tell you how we, how we do what we do. Two little warm-ups are, are um, the donut shop and the flip crayons. You'll see a, a sheet of the donut shop on the next slide. The flip crayons, I, I brought a box. And again, this is handwriting without tears. This is their product. It's really kind of a cool thing. All right, so flip crayons. You say to kids, what is different about this crayon than most crayons you use? It has two sides. Yes, it has two sides. Is, is it big or is it little? It's little. That's right. Let me show you how we do that. And so we start that little song again. My thumb is bent. Point your points to the tip. And when they're doing this, you know what they realize? They're so small, 
you can't get all those other fingers on. When we talk about not loading up all your fingers or doing a gross grasp, you, you can't do it on these tiny little crayons. They, they, uh, they kind of look at their hands like, what do I do with that? Oh, yeah, stick it upside down. I tuck my fingers in. So that, that is how they start to color. But the best thing, you, I think, to use these flip crayons for, for warm-ups, flip, flip. And it looks easy. I've, I've done this a few years. Flip, flip. But if you want to try some when we're done and see what that feels like, that warms up the muscles ready to color, ready to do your pre-writing, ready to do your writing. It's, a, it's very good for coordination, stability, mobility. All right, so you can see on the far left, my, my little friend over here was doing such a great job. He was flipping those crayons and coloring in my crab and just practicing secret side down and flip and flip and flip, and over here, this is called the donut shop, make yours at home. All you do, circles, and tiny circles, and a little bit larger circles. And what a donut shop is about is giving the kids an opportunity to color by going counterclockwise and frosting the donuts. If they have tiny hands, they can do the jelly centers. If they have a little bit bigger hands, they can say blueberry, chocolate, and they can frost them counterclockwise that's because that's how we write. So think about it. The letter C, counterclockwise. C can turn into letter O. C can turn into letter G. C can turn into letter D. C can turn into lowercase q. And if you would do cursive writing, then that left to right progression as well, counterclockwise. So that's a really good warm up sheet. All right, encouraging a, a variety of color strokes. Why is that important? Like that little crab, there was the, his eyeballs are circles, and if you do his arms, they kind of going up and across and down. Well, if you think about it, letter L, hello, that's vertical. Letter O, aren't, isn't that circular? That's round and round and round we go. And across, if you're going to make the letter T or L or H, that has horizontal lines in it. That's why we like to have a variety of coloring strokes when you do color. And uh, I threw in this for the sake of the kindergarten teachers. Tell them to use a variety of colors because that's what we do in kindergarten, which is so true. Any kindergarten class, now let's try another color. Can you? And I think it's the concept of teaching them colors. So it's an opportunity for you to, to get them ahead of the game for education there. For this one, staying near the boundary lines, that's going to help with their um, excursion uh, of all those different letter strokes that we want moving around. It's just kind of makes it a little bit more fluid. We don't want perfection. We want fun. We want to work those finger muscles. So some children do best lying on the floor, kind of like that tummy time all over again. So if you're on the floor and your head is up, that gives you a little bit more support. That's one way to do it. You know what some kids do best? Also, if you were going to tape a picture on a window or use an easel, your wrist naturally flips back and makes it easier for some kids to color. So you can keep that in mind as well. And this was at my little friend, and he was showing you how to do those different color strokes, like I said, circle, vertical, horizontal. Pre-writing strokes. This is on your handout for a reason. You can copy these at home. You can laminate them, or you can just trace over them. But this is really good for the kids to practice. We call them pre-writing. This is how writing develops. So when they're early on, age two to three, you're going to see top row. You're going to see vertical, horizontal, circle, cross. As you start to get older, three, four years old, that, that square is directionality. You need that for handwriting. That bottom corner just looks like an uppercase L right there. They need to learn how to stop and then switch directions. And then, of course, diagonals start coming in, combining diagonals. So at the bottom here, by age four or five, you do want to see them getting going with Xs. By age five, age six would be a, um, an amazing diamond. That's really tricky for all those, those switches. But these are pre-writing strokes, and if you practice those, they would lend themselves for kindergarten for writing. 
Alrighty, how to cut with scissors. I have another prop, but you can relax. It's not a very large scissors, it's regular. Okay. Now, when you have a pair of scissors, what we do is we teach the kids thumbs up. That's a key phrase, thumbs up, because if thumbs down, you're going to rotate at your shoulder. And we don't want that. We want thumbs up. Thumb goes in the little hole. Now this one, I'm, you might not have heard about. A lot of times we have, we ask the teachers, teach the kids, put the palm, excuse me, point your finger on the outside for added stability. So you know we talk about there's muscles that begin and end in your hand, and there's muscles that begin and end way by your elbow. If you use your pointer finger <coughs> on the outside, that makes that tendon cross the wrist and it gives you more stability. Very good. When we talk about low tone, loose ligaments, that's just one more thing that helps manage that wrist. So, thumbs up, point your finger on the outside, and if you even look at, I think it's Fisker's brand nowadays, or Kindergarten Scissors, they actually have a little divot built in for that, for that index finger. And then you can put the middle fingers into the larger hole, one or two, and you still will get secret side down with either your pinky or your ring finger and your pinky, and that's going to help you for cutting. And the other one, elbows close to your body. If, if I gave you um, a toothpick and a pony bead and said, I want you to, to put those two items together, I want you to lace that, but you have to do it way out here. You'd struggle a little bit because you're using your shoulder, you're using your elbow, you're using your wrist, you're using all of your thumb, your thumb muscles, your finger muscles, your eyes way out here. Bop, boom. You bring it in closer to your elbows. Those words again, proximal stability lends itself to mobility. So that same pony bead, that same toothpick, boom, you could thread that so easily right here. So we teach kids, thumbs up, elbows close in, and then they can start cutting. And there is a difference between right hand and left hand scissors. If people ask you that, um, right hand, all you have to do is, is open up a pair of scissors. Don't look at the handle, look at the blade. And if the blade is on the right side by your right thumb, right handed scissors. And if the upper blade is on the left side, that's going to be for your left handed kiddos. About 10% are left handed. So it's, it's, it's not the end of the world, it is tougher, the blades bite a little bit more, and if you're using the wrong pair of scissors for your dominance, you might be cutting on the inside of the line a little bit more. You could try it sometime yourself at home. And darn it, here was a cute little cutting video that didn't show up, but you can see that he has his pointer finger on the outside, he has his thumb in the middle, the little hole, and then he's using his helper hand to rotate. That's what we, we tell the kids. Your other hand doesn't sit there. It is a helping hand. So you have your cutting hand and you have your helping hand. Secret to success is play, play, play. And that, that's all our preschool. Our main focus is to get your hands stronger and to get them coordinated. Now, Play-Doh, um, I do have, I'm going to show you I'm going to minimize this PowerPoint and pull up some, some handouts that I have made for Play-Doh and just show you some ideas of things you can do with your kids because my video is uploading, so this is the next best thing. Alrighty, righty. Um, squishing. You can see that that one's going to help with those thinner muscles. We talk about getting that arching. Anytime you're using strengthening, 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 you can just imagine grasping onto something. Bam! There's that arch. There's those muscles on the side. And when we roll, 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 like he's doing on that upper left, that's the back of your hand and it gives it a really good, not just a stretch, it strengthens the muscles on the back side of the hand. And we were talking about how you hold a crayon, we said, and that when we said no duck, just a crab hello, because we want both sets of muscles, the ones that begin and end in your hand as well as the ones that begin and end in, in your elbow. That's what rolling does. 
That's another good one. Pulling, gross grasp again. Can't you see that? Palmer arches, you're getting those muscles built up. Pinching, and you, and you know I told him secret side down, right? He's pinching with his thumb and his finger, so he's getting it nice and strong. Poking, especially the index finger. This one's tricky. Roll tiny, roll tiny balls with secret side down. So if he's pinching and pulling up a chunk of that Play-Doh, secret side down, roll, 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 and try to make a ball. Try that one with your kids. That one's pretty tricky. Poking with items, hiding things, and then trying to find them. That's also strengthening and getting those little muscles at the end all ready to go. You can use tools. I'm sure we've got a Play-Doh fans in the world. So you can use cookie cutters. You can decorate. You can smash it. You can roll it. A lot of different things for Play-Doh. And All right, I'm not sure if this is next in the slideshow of the main one, but since I'm, I'm over here, I'm going to show you this other one for fine motor activities that go with play, play, play at home. Sliding beads onto dry spaghetti pasta. And you see that how that Play-Doh came in handy again? So those, these are all dollar store things. I just went to the dollar store, spent 10 bucks, and, and you have a complete home program. So little pony beads on, on a piece of pasta or even those little tiny barbecue wooden skewers, that works. Dropping cotton balls into a container with a hole in the lid, secrets are done. Okay, we cut Q-tips in half and then we had him put them into a tiny opening in a tic-tac container, nice and small. So one hand again is your helper hand and the other one is going in. Plastic chips in a box with a slit at the top. Beating pasta on a pipe cleaner, pipe cleaner rescue. Put pipe cleaners in potato chip container with punched out holes. You can push those pipe cleaners into a colander. Now at the dollar store, I didn't know they had these cute little one dollar collapsible colanders. And kids can make crazy designs with that. Placing toothpicks into spice containers. Look at that beautiful two point pinch we got going on there. Helper hand and your dominant hand. We have little itty bitty tongs. And what I did is, is went to the dollar store and cut up little um, sponges, dish sponges. And he's putting them into one at a time with tongs, putting them into an ice cube tray. Squeezing chip clips and placing them on a container. Dollar store, aren't those cute? And then, of course, always going back to the basic of what kindergarten teachers are looking for. Cutting and coloring. And you, you've um, got that handout on your, on your sheet for the pre-writing strokes. So it's all good things to help you prepare. Okay, dokie. I'm kind of laughing because I think the next one might be the last one. We'll see. Fine motor activities. We did that. Yes. Work in progress. Together we make a difference. This is a celebration of your children. This is us helping you. This is if we can help you help your children. I really think we're going to turn this whole thing around with kids not being ready with their hands for kindergarten. So um, I commend you all for being here. I commend you all for being part of your child's life. And um, let, we'll celebrate your children. Now, um, I'm available for any questions. I can help answer some questions you might have about the presentation or in general. Anybody have anything? Yes. When my daughter's writing, um, she has trouble with colored pencils because she doesn't push as hard as she's supposed to. Do, do you have any suggestions with different things to color with, like crayons, markers, colored pencils? Crayons give you a little bit more resistance and some feedback into your hands. Um, often, often kids with loose ligaments and lower muscle tone that we talked about, how you feel and get information into, into your hands, into your brain, believe it or not, is through your joints. It's in your
right over here that's going to go up here. A couple things. So one is her regulation is a little bit off, like how hard she thinks she is. There are some kids who will have, um, what are the mechanical pencils? And they're snapping them because they can't believe how hard they're pushing, where others are so light you can't read their handwriting. A couple things that I do is I start with the um, Play-Doh and I do that heavy work, heavy work. Just get that input to regulate that information in their joints. Another thing is I'll put two circles and we're going to color them in. And I'll say, make this one dark, 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 as hard as you can. Make this one light. It's like, oh, I can still see it later, 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 later. And then we do one now just right. So you get that just right coloring. Another way to get input, because crayons do have, they're waxier, so they have more input than um, a pencil, a lightweight pencil. You can put something like sandpaper underneath and do coloring back and forth and that bumpity bump and that input is another way. Sometimes we'll use, do you remember those, well, I think they still have them, squiggly wiggly pens, those vibratory pens that you put in your hand and do that little squiggle. Vibration is another way to wake up, they're called proprioceptors um, and they, they receive the information but vibration is another way to wake that up. Uh, does anybody else have any more questions? Yes. As far as using like scissors, what, what's the age that you would start having them work with scissors? Oh my gosh, much sooner than they are. I, they come to kindergarten and they've never used them. So you. Oh, certainly. Sorry about that. The question is, is about when do you start using scissors? And it certainly de depends on the child because we talk about it one and a half is gross grass. They're just learning how to separate the sides of their hand. And at two to three, they're pronating a little bit. And three to four is when we get that static grip. So age three to four, when they're starting, it doesn't have to be exactly that age, but when they're starting to separate the sides of their hands, then they can start cutting with adult supervision. But you're, that is great because we are getting a lot of kids in kindergarten that aren't using scissors. And, and that's a good skill to be ahead of the game on. You can start using scissors if your child is showing that they're separating the sides of their hand. You, you, there are plastic blades out there, and you might want to start with that. And a good way to start is play out to the rescue. Do this roll, roll, roll into the tube, and you, you can use start with a plastic blade and just snip the Play-Doh. is a great way to start. Um, also, heavier like sandpaper again or hard stock is way easier. It gives that information back to the child's hands again. Wow. This is cutting a lot harder to go out than it is to go in. But you can start simple snips. We, you don't have to go crazy and cutting circles like we saw for kindergarten. You can do um, one inch piece of card stock, snip, snip, snip. It's messy, but what kids love is we call it straw popping. Take straws from the dollar store, oh boy, and they snip it, pop, pop, and they go flying around the room. Then what <laughs> pop, and then what you can do, um, make it easier. I'm so proud of thinking of this. I take, I, <laughs> I wrap their hands in painter's tape and, and, and um, have them crawl around and pick up the pop straws by crawling and having it stick to their tape and then less work for me. And, and it's good for their hands. It's really good for their hands. Yes? How could you tell the difference between the left and the right handed scissors again? What was that blade work again? For left and right hand scissors? Oh, I'm sorry, what was that Randy? I couldn't hear you. <laughs> I'm going to repeat the question. The question is, how can you tell the difference for right hand versus left hand? And I think what throws people is we tend to look at the handle, because that's where our hand goes, and it's darker, right? But you, you just open it up a little bit, and you, there's a fulcrum that holds the two blades together, and the one on the outside, you know, whether you're holding it on your right or your left, it should be on the outside blade. In this case, it's right-handed scissors. The, this one is on the outside, and if it was left-handed, the one on top would be my outside one. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And there are a few tricks for left-handed writers to hold back an inch and a half from the tip, tilt your paper a little bit more in. Left-handers do have a little bit more to, to work. All right, another question. Yes? What's the difference between baby pinch or grass? Um, it's different than separating um, Because that's a two-point pinch. It's a beginning pinch, and we love seeing Isn't that cute when they grab those little Cheerios? But also when they're pinching like this, these muscles right here, they're called intrinsic. They begin in your hand, and they, they end at your joint here. And they just do this, like that close quacking duck. And it's great developmentally. But as we get older and our hand matures and develops, we want to tuck it back and, and get more of that flexor curl at the end. For this is a true blue two point pitch. Oh, yes. With, with knives, you mean the scissors again? Oh, for cutting, like for food? Um, I don't know that exactly. Um, but piercing and scooping, um, I guess when you think they're ready, if they can, because it's, it's not that tough for coordination. I mean, you stabilize something with one hand, and then you've got a static grip on the knife, and you're going back and forth. I think anytime you think they're ready, I don't have a special age answer for that. But it, it it's two hands together. You can try it. Try it with that Play-Doh again. Big on Play-Doh. Yeah. <laughs> Is there another question I can help out with? I'm sorry, what's that? I have a three and a half year old. And if they're holding it like this, should, should it be encouraged to... Yes. You can try it. And oh, God darn it. <laughs> Repeat the question. Thank you, Karen. Yep. Okay, our question is her child is three and a half and still has that prone. That, mm -hmm. One way, one way to help if a child is in that pronated, in that forefinger down position, and we want to get them into that static, go back to elbows in, and that'll help. Another way is if you do that vertical surface, like the window or the aisles. What happens with our hand, and you can even practice this right now, it's called tenodesis, and if you just flip your wrist back, we tend to naturally go into a tripod or a two-point pinch, and that encourages it if you're going to do some vertical work. Yes, you always want to make it fun. You, you, it always has to be play, and it always has to be fun. Is there another question that I could repeat? <laughs> Okay, then I'm going to bop next door to the other room. We have English as a Second Language audience over there, and I'm going to see if I can help them out. I just want to say thank you so much. All thank right. You. You're welcome. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I, oh, sure. My last one is my references. I always feel better. Oop. There it is. There we go. Three great references. Awesome. And the OT mama, you have a handout from her in your um, materials packet. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I did a slight miscalculation with the pizza order. So you'll notice all of the boxes on the top are full. So I would like to offer all of you a parting gift of a pizza to take with you. <laughs> it would save me from trying to find a home for them. So feel free to take one or two. Have a great night. I hope you'll join us again next month and the month after. Thank you.